next. I'm really excited about uh, the next program. I'm excited to introduce um, what's coming. What's coming ahead? Uh, the, the recent uh, terrible George Floyd um, death and situation touched a nerve um, with all of us, um, both personally and professionally. It has triggered us to look, look uh, deeper and think more about, I think more differently about what we're doing. Uh, it's a real opportunity to open ourselves and to learn and and to do better. Um, Diversity and inclusion has always been an important part of our section, uh, but our progress has, has frankly been, been limited. Uh, one of my priorities for this year is to create a tangible, measurable um, uh, uh, metrics of results from, from, um, from this at, um, uh, in the coming year. Um, with that in mind, I'm pleased to introduce the moderator for the next panel, um, uh, uh, who is a, one of our young shining stars um, in our section, Diana Kalala. Uh, Diana is a senior associate at Alston and Bird, and she is chair of our diversity advanced committee. Um, Diana, I will hand off this tremendous program to you. Thank you so much for moderating. Thank you so much, Gary, and good morning, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time out to join us here today. As Gary mentioned, I'm a senior associate at Alston and Bird, practicing in their antitrust practice group. And I'm also the chair of the newest initiative within the diversity section of the antitrust section, Diversity Advance. Today, I'll be serving for, as your moderator in what I hope will be an inspiring and informative panel about race, equity, and the antitrust law section. We've got two dynamic groups of panels packed into one powerful program, and this is all with the goal to inspire you and empower you to take up the call to action that we're going to issue at the end of this panel. So please stay tuned to the very end. Now, I'm joined today by two uh, panelists, Judge Donald and Professor Overton. Um, I'll just share a brief introduction of the two because they'll share a little bit about their background as well. Judge Bernice Donald is a circuit court judge for the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. She's also an avid sponsor and leader within the antitrust section, and she currently serves as a member of the Leadership Development Special Operations Team. Professor Overton is the president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. He's also a law professor at George Washington University, and if that wasn't enough, he's also husband to one of our section leaders, Leslie Overton. Judge Donald, Professor Overton, welcome. Thank you. Now, I understand that both of you would like to share a few remarks at the beginning of our discussion to help deepen and guide our conversation today. So Judge Donald, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Deanna. And let me just say how proud I am to be a part of the important work of the antitrust section. I commend all of the leadership for your commitment, your energy, your dedication to the profession and the larger society. Harvard-educated writer, a civil rights activist, historian, and sociologist, W.E.B. Du Bois observed that the problem of the 20th century is the color line, how prescient he was. The issue of race has dominated politics and society for a generation. Today, issues of race, class, gender equality, and gender identity, among others, are front and center still. In 2008, when President Barack Obama was elected and served, I think people had begun to believe that we were approaching a post-racial society. Uh, after all, the election of the first African-American president was a watershed moment. But even as we uh, experienced euphoria over that uh, event, our country braced itself, I believe, uh, for regression. You and Gary have alluded to injustice, inequality, and social stratification that has now become a fixture in today's society. Much of the data that we all consume exposes a myriad of issues. Uh, there's overrepresentation of African Americans in jails and prisons. Uh, many of those are marked by district sentence links. Some of those that were codified 
uh, by Congress. There's been a closing of access to courthouses to plaintiffs, in many instances, women, people of color, and the poor. And the New York Times noted in, in a, an essay piece in 2016 that the, the dominance and power in our country is reposed still largely in the hands of white male. They did a pictorial display showing the presence of, of people of color in those leadership roles that really influenced public thought and much public action. And it was really uh, powerful in the, the paucity of diversity in many of those main areas. We've also noticed a slowing of diversity and inclusion in the partner ranks of law firms. And that has been also marked by an exodus of a number of women of color who've opted for whatever reason to leave uh, firms and some to leave the profession. Our legal profession, uh, it, it, I must note, is one of the least diverse um, professions. And that has remained so for quite some time. Today, roughly 85% of the legal profession is white, 5% African-American, 3% uh, Asian, 5% uh, Latino or Hispanic, and some 2% uh, other. 62% of our profession is male and 38% female. When you look at Fortune 500 uh, corporations, 70% uh, of the general counsel positions are occupied by men, 30% occupied by women. In the law school dean uh, suite, 65% of the law school deans are male compared to 35% female. And the judiciary uh, has tremendous strides to make. Uh, those numbers are not representative. We know that on the Supreme Court, for the first time in our history, there are three women on the court um, out of the nine. But on the circuit courts of appeal, uh, the, the number of the percentage of women, rather, 36.8%. This is from an ABA report, and 59% uh, are 59 women, rather, 30, which comprises 36.8% of the, uh, the member bench. Uh, on the district courts, uh, women come in at 34%. Now I must tell you that the numbers are far less representative when it comes to women of color. And the same is true when you look at the Article I judiciary. You know, I must note uh, anecdotally that when I came on the bankruptcy court in 1988, uh, I was the ninth active bankruptcy judge in the country, the first African-American woman to ever have served in such a position in the country. And I believe today uh, the numbers have not gone much beyond that. Uh, I believe now uh, it's at 12 or 13. So we have a lot of work to do. When we look at the state courts in the United States, uh, women's numbers have finally uh, crept up to about 22, 23% women of color at 8%, and many of those uh, positions are appointed, others are elected, and, I, 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 and I'm not going to get into the debate right now about whether merit selection or actually popular election uh, generates greater diversity, but we have some issues. Um, it's important because in courts across the country, every individual entering a courtroom ought to believe that they can come in and get a fair shake regardless of, of their race, their gender, their socioeconomic status, their political beliefs, everyone. And sometimes we don't think about that, but for much of the country, they are skeptical about whether there really is true justice or whether justice is rationed according to some other arbitrary factor. I will diverge for just a moment and share with you that when I first became a judge back in 1982, and I was an elected judge, my first courtroom was staffed by the clerk. And because I was the first African-American woman in the state of Tennessee to become a judge, uh, that person was a friend. He was a middle-aged white male, but he wanted me to be comfortable. He wanted to be supportive. He wanted to give me everything I needed to be successful. And so he staffed my courtroom with all African-American support personnel. When I opened court the afternoon of my first day, the first person to enter the courtroom was a young white male. 
he was astounded by the, the courtroom environment. He looked around with wide eyes and I think with some fear and saw no one in that courtroom who looked like him. That must have caused him concern about whether or not he could reasonably expect to get justice. So he came to the bench and asked me for a continuous and I granted that for 30 days. 30 days later, he came back to court armed with an African-American defense attorney. I then told our clerk how much I appreciated him wanting me to be comfortable, but diversity and having everybody else comfortable was much more important. And so we changed out some of the court personnel and brought in a diverse team. And I believe that that made a difference in the perception of justice. Because you see, Deanna, the perception of justice is just as important as the reality of justice. And I'm reminded of a study that was done by the National Conference of Christians and Jews more than five decades ago, asking people whether they believed that they could get a fair shake in court, be it civil or criminal. Overwhelmingly, African-Americans believed that they could not get a fair shake, whether it was civil or criminal. That was followed closely by Latinos or Hispanics, then by Asians. Only whites felt that they could get a fair shake, whether it was civil or criminal. And I am, I, I'm sad to say that Native Americans were not a part of that survey, which speaks to the invisibility when it comes to the issues of Native American people. I've talked a little bit about the judiciary and who sits on the bench, but what about the support personnel for federal courts? What about judicial clerkships? We know about the power of judicial clerkships. And still, while women have made uh, tremendous progress there, women of color and law clerks of color, period, still suffer very low uh, uh, rates in terms of getting uh, clerkships. Right now, Jeremy Fogel, a judge out of California, and um, Justice Goodwin Liu, along with another team of us, have started to survey uh, to identify those barriers and see what strategies we can use to try and increase, enhance, and widen opportunities for uh, law clerks of color. And I am looking forward to, uh, to uh, fully participating uh, and then ultimately uh, examining the results of that study. But I do know that implicit bias plays a role in many of these things. We simply see people differently uh, in many instances, and we have preconceived notions about people's abilities and capabilities. Dr. Erin Reeves did a study that many of you probably have heard about where uh, she used a particular, I believe, uh, associate law associate memo, and maybe it was by a third year law student. They took one memo that was filled with uh, errors of, of various sorts, and they brought in a team of partners, and these were diverse partners, to look at that memo and rate it on a, a, on a um, one to five point scale. Half of the memos were credited to uh, a, a student who was African-American, uh, and the other half were credited to a student who was white. The partners reviewing the, the, that memo overwhelmingly found uh, more numerous errors in the memo that was, that was assigned to an African-American. Uh, they had more critical comments. Uh, that memo was rated 3.2 on a five-point scale or maybe it was 3.4, I'm not looking at the stats right now, but it was rated much lower in the three range. But for that same memo with those same errors, the memo was rated like a 4.2 out of a five point scale for uh, the, uh, the, the white writer. And the comments were much more critical when it came to the African-American. And I tell you that because that speaks to how we view uh, uh, and, and who we accord a presumption of competence and who we don't. And for many people, that those biases keep people from ever getting an opportunity to demonstrate who they are and what they could do. I want to just say, as I come to a close, we are committed to diversity. And we have done fairly well uh, in, in some dimensions of diversity. And I'm defining diversity as including all the ways in which people differ one from another and which groups differ one from another. And so that can include race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, physical appearances, ideological thought, and even geographic location. So we have done that because the world is more pluralistic 
And out of that pluralism, the pool of people that we view is going to increasingly be more diverse. But when it comes to the terms that we talked about this morning that Gary talked about, equity and inclusion, we've not done as well. And there I'm defining equity as the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of certain groups and certain individuals. So improving equity involves increasing justice and fairness. It means according and recognizing dignity and worth. And it requires that we tackle equity issues by understanding the root causes of many of the outcome disparities within our society. And when I talk about inclusion, uh, we're talking about the act of creating environments in which individuals or groups can be and do feel welcome, respected, supported, and valued to fully participate in the enterprise. And that's where we have to get to. Uh, And I will say to you today that I am very pleased that we are committing ourselves anew to the issues that not only confront uh, the section, the profession, but also society at large. And I am uh, honored to be a part of that effort when it comes to this section, the judiciary, our profession, and the society at large. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Donald. And I really appreciate you setting the stage for our discussion in terms of the issues that we face and also the right terminology to use so that we're all on the same page. And we'll delve into all of that a little bit more later, but first I wanna turn it over to Professor Overton to share his introductory remarks. Thank you. And also, Judge Daniel, thank you. I mean, it's really an honor to be on a panel with you. As you know, I clerked uh, on the Sixth Circuit for Judge Keith. Yes. You know, he passed about a year ago, just over a year. And I know he would be so proud of you and the outstanding service that you're providing uh, to our country right now. So please keep on and and keep doing your good work. It's just, again, an honor to be here with you. Uh, Gary, uh, thanks so much for including me. And I also want to thank my favorite antitrust lawyer, uh, Leslie Overton uh, here. (laughs) It's fun to be back with you all. You know, the summer meeting is really like a family reunion for me in terms of it was so good to see people that I hadn't seen. The biggest problem this year is that there is no golf. That's that's the big problem. Although I guess it's not too tragic. I remember one time we were in Canada, I forget if it was Banff or somewhere, and I saw a bear in the wild on the golf course. And I was just, after that, like every time, like there's a squirrel next to my cart, I'm thinking it's a bear, you know, it was, it was, it was no joke. So, uh, so it, it's great to be in some ways in the, in the safety of, of Zoom. So ABA, these recent demonstrations that we've seen in our country, you know, they've elevated certainly the issue of, of policing, right? But they've also opened our nation's eyes to our long history. Uh, frankly, uh, as Judge Donald talked about, kind of this marginalization of black folks in America, you know, again, based on data, this isn't kind of hearsay, this is, you know, concrete studies here. And and so we've got to address policing, but that can't be the end of it. And again, this is bigger than all of this, us. It's not about somebody being evil and bad and a racist. This is a system that we're all a part of and that we all have to work together to figure out how we how we move forward and and really you know kind of lift up uh these principles that are are not always lived out in in real real life so an important part of this again is policing but another important part is the economy as we rebuild our economy we shouldn't just return to the status quo We definitely want to rebuild an economy where everyone has an opportunity to be a part of it and add value. Um, 
Now, just a snapshot, you know, the pandemic has hit Black communities particularly hard. I am at the Joint Center, which is America's Black think tank, has been around since 1970. Uh, even though my specialty is voting rights, the Joint Center focuses on both kind of voting issues and political issues. Um, in the African-American community, let me just go through a few numbers. Uh, you, you all wouldn't be in your business if you didn't appreciate numbers, I hear, right? Uh, a June study showed that 31% of African-Americans know, know someone who has died from COVID-19 compared to 9% of white Americans. African-Americans are three times more likely to contract COVID, uh, about uh, twice as likely to pass away uh, from it. Uh, black workers are about 12% of all workers in the United States, but they're 17% of all frontline workers and more than that. So we talk about healthcare, we talk about uh, retail, uh, you know, uh, trucking, manufacturing, logistics, those types of, of jobs, right? In terms of businesses, uh, the number, raw number of black businesses between February and May fell 26%. That's compared to about 11% in terms of white Americans. In terms of uh, employment, by 24% of black workers have been laid off or furloughed since the outbreak compared to 11% of whites. Uh, less than half of black adults have jobs and that hasn't happened since 1983. Um, the, uh, in June, the unemployment rate was the, had the widest gap between whites and blacks in, in five years. Uh, and, and so we've seen these unemployment rates begin to rise because, you know, they're weekly unemployment claims that begin to rise. So we can see that this go up as the, the virus starts to spread and states are starting to shut down or impose more restrictions here. We also saw the poverty rate of non-elderly Black folks. It rose about uh, eight percentage uh, points between February and May. There's only about half of that for, for, for white folks. Uh, in May, 28% uh, of black homeowners missed or deferred a mortgage payment uh, uh, here. Uh, and, um, you know, there are other housing stats I won't get into. One, one stat I do want to mention is that over 3 million black children, uh, a little over 30%, live in households without high-speed internet access and are unable to receive adequate remote uh, instruction right here, right? Uh, so there is an immediate issue that we've got to deal with. You know, Congress is talking about that in terms of the stimulus. Uh, the Joint Center just came out with a report yesterday on that. It's on our website. I won't get into the details there. But there's some longer term things that we need to do. Uh, one, one issue is black economists uh, here, right? Uh, you know, there are very few black lawyers, uh, as Judge Donald talks about, but, but there are also very few black economists. Only about 3% of economists are black. Uh, as you all know, a lot of traditional economics is about assumptions. Uh, and, you know, the lack of diversity affects the field. Uh, Dr. Derek Hamilton, he explains it like this. Uh, often economic markets focus on, let's say, skill sets. Uh, hey, uh, income being, uh, wealth being correlated to skills uh, here. So the argument here is if there's racial inequality, it may be because black folks have fewer skills, less training, less education. But, but when Dr. Hamilton looked at the data, he found that uh, the typical black family where the head of household has a college degree, that typical household has less wealth than the typical household of a white person who is a high school dropout, who does not have a high school diploma, right? So 
wealth, really, uh, you know, African Americans, we talk about a lot of factors behind this in terms of redlining and uh, other factors that are, are out there that contribute to this, you know, these disparities in wealth. You know, and as a result, people have a harder time dealing with unemployment. They have a harder time in terms of like starting a business or keeping the business afloat, uh, et cetera. Uh, the whole point is that there are these other factors that are involved in economics. And we need to start to take a serious look at that. And part of that involves uh, opening the door and diversifying um, uh, economics in and of, it, of itself uh, here, right? Second is we design uh, strategies. We want to really target them or design them for communities. So the conventional wisdom is that a policy like the GI Bill, you know, created the middle class and raised all boats. Uh, you remember there was a tuition benefit and a mortgage benefit, but the law actually increased racial disparities because African-Americans on the whole who were returning those vets couldn't take advantage of the mortgage benefit because of redlining and racially restrictive covenants in particular areas. So the areas that they could buy in, those areas they couldn't get the mortgage benefit uh, for. And then in terms of the tuition benefit, uh, there were quotas on the number of Blacks who could go to uh, schools in the North. In the South, Black folks couldn't go uh, to uh, white institutions and HBCUs didn't have the capacity for all the returning vets. So those are two factors that aren't as far as back as slavery, right? Of race neutral laws that, that really increase disparities in wealth uh, here. Uh, and obviously we talk about intergenerational transfers of wealth and opportunities that folks have today. You know, often it is because of the opportunities that our parents or our grandparents uh, had here, right? So um, I think um, a couple quick points that I'll, I'll end with uh, that I hope we can get into in the discussion a little deeper. Private sector has a huge role to play. You know, people who are at law firms, people who are at companies, as you know, Fortune 500 alone account for, accounts for about um, two thirds of our GDP in our country, right? And so some of the decisions that companies can make uh, when it comes to their own circle of influence in terms of employee hiring and development, contracting, uh, the C-suite, board, uh, you know, leadership, you know, that's uh, important. Uh, certainly, uh, when we talk about uh, supporting policies that allow for workforce development and new opportunities uh, for folks in terms of companies supporting those types of, of policies, you know, in their company, but then also uh, public policies. Uh, and then also, you know, supporting uh, organizations of, of color. Certainly the Joint Center falls into that, that category, but there are many others uh, that are, are focused on solutions. So this notion of infrastructure and agency. So this is not just about uh, doing some charitable thing, but how do you help folks uh, exercise some agency and, and, and be a part of the solution here. So I'll stop there and look forward to our discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor Overton. And I, honestly, we could all just stop here after that informative and enlightening uh, discussion that both of you just led. But for the good of the order, we will continue. And I do have some questions that I'd like to um, take just to delve a little bit deeper into what you all talked about. Um, and I'll start with you, Judge Donald. You made a really great point about how representation affects the perception of justice. And you talked about some of the troubling statistics that you're seeing in the legal profession and in the judiciary. And I think that's pretty true no matter which realm of the law you're talking about. Um, for example, if you look at my uh, area of uh, experience within law firms, um, you touched on this too just a little bit. Um, if you look at the statistics, despite making up 13% of the overall national population, 
a recent 2019 NALP study found that of all partners, Black partners made up only 1.97%. And if you look at Black female partners, that number so much worse, it's less than 1% at 0.75%. And this is a trend that's either remained flat or has worsened over the past decade, despite the fact that so many of these law firms have instituted diversity programs. Can you talk a little bit about what you think some of the leaders in this room can be doing to help reverse those statistics? Thank you, Deanna. I, I just want to underscore what you said, that these are definitely troubling statistics. Professor David Wilkins uh, at Harvard has, has been looking particularly at women of color uh, partners and, and their exodus for, from uh, many firms. I think there are a number of factors. We have to look at the, the culture uh, that exist in, in firms and in other areas. And when we bring people, you know, we've gotten better at recruiting, but we have not focused uh, on the retention side of it. We have not focused on making certain people have in those uh, areas what they need to succeed. And we have not made in an environment that is, is welcoming. And I don't mean just smiling at people and giving them a nice office and all of that. Uh, how do we interact with people when they, when they are uh, coming into the firms? Are we, are we giving them the benefit of working on, uh, to use John Lewis's phrase, good work? Are we really including them in uh, the uh, significant um, presentations? Or are we simply using the, 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 the women of color and the lawyers of color uh, initially for, uh, for the, 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 the facial diversity representation? Um, you know, are, you, are you trying to channel all of your people of color primarily into certain areas and not uh, encouraging them to work on broader things? I think those kind of things, the self-examination by firms and, and other entities about what we want, what we expect, and how we, what kind of environment we are creating. Um, it's one thing to say that you have mentors at the firm, but I think people coming in also need sponsors. And uh, the sponsors don't have to be people who look like you, but there certainly ought to be some other people in that, in that, in that space. So I think that people have to do a self-assessment of, uh, of the, the organization, and they've got to really make a real commitment. Because if the commitment is real, then people are held accountable for recruiting. If you, if you say, I wanna find um, good lawyers in a certain area, I wanna find people of color, you know, where, where are you looking? Uh, are you only using, uh, you know, getting references from people who, who uh, look like you? So I think that there are a number of things that, that uh, firms ought to be doing, but I, I think the focusing on retention through creating an environment that promotes and encourages the best uh, opportunity for people to succeed, making sure that all people are respected and valued, making sure that people get, a, get an opportunity to do the real and significant work, uh, broadening the recruitment ranks uh, and, and the areas where you're searching, and ultimately making a real investment, not just in the person for what you think they can do uh, for you, but making an investment in them so that they can achieve their highest and best potential and creating that environment that lets people know that um, through words and action, that uh, this is a place that welcomes, respects and values the dignity and worth of, of all people and that uh, you recognize their contributions, laud and applaud those and reward those. those are my Judge Donald, thank you so much, Judge Donald. And I think your point about cultivating a, a culture that includes people is so important. And I think it really highlights the work that the section is working to do right now through this panel and the upcoming training and call to action that folks will hear about at the end. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Professor Overton, maybe we can turn to you and broaden the discussion. Um, so we live in a 
society right now that's in the wake of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the tragically long list of other people that have died at the hands of police brutality. And we also are living through a time where there have been mass protests and growing support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I feel like in many ways, this generation defining moment is cultivating, uh, culminating in a discussion of systemic racism and bias. And in your talk, you focused a bit on um, the ways that policies like the race neutral laws that um, were passed after vets were coming back, um, those policies can either have the effect of entrenching or eliminating bias. Can you talk a bit about the anti-racist actions and policies that we within the section should be taking as leaders, both within the section, but also within the communities where we work and live? Sure, thank you so much. You know, I think the first thing we have to do is just recognize that all this stuff is hard. And when I say hard, I'm not just talking about uncomfortable conversations. I'm talking about the fact that you know, we've got billable hours, we've got folks we work for, we've got children, we've got maybe aging parents, we've got all these responsibilities that are going on. And it's difficult for us to kind of add one more thing to that. So I want to just start by saying, I understand that we've got these competing demands and we are all stretched thin. And so it's really kind of just sometimes hard to think about one more thing that isn't always, doesn't seem to be in our circle of influence or doesn't seem to be quantifiable. I wanna, I wanna just recognize that. But, but I'd also urge us to not be indifferent to this issue. Right. I think one of the things about George Floyd was the indifference to someone dying kind of right there in front of us uh, here. And I think it also affected a number of Black people and, and other folks of color because, you know, even though they didn't literally have a knee on their neck, they maybe thought back to times where people were indifferent with regard to them or where they were marginalized or where they were discounted or where, where they said something insightful in a meeting were ignored and five minutes later, someone else who looked different than they look said the same thing and was heralded and applauded right here, right? And so the question here is how can we be conscious and recognize the humanity of, of, of folks in light of the different demands on our time and the competing issues here? So as, as we think about this in terms of our own work environment, you know, just real straight like training. How do we learn kind of what is implicit bias? Uh, I'm going to give a huge, like I've never told this story. Never. You know, this is for, for, lean for in you for this, all, one. Right? this is, right? <laughs> I was interviewing for a job and I went in and most, you know, and, and this was when I was going on the market to be a law professor. And uh, there were two white, older white men and one very young black male. And you know, most of these interviews have, um, have uh, a student at them, right? Most of these interviews have a student. I was tired, I was worn out, I was under the gun. I spent the whole time talking to those two white men in terms of my eyes trying to get this job. And I really did not engage with the younger black male. And it turns out he was a faculty member. Number one, it was wrong to discount the student, right? Kind of thinking, well, people were scholars. We're not really interested in teaching. That was wrong, right? <laughs> but, but also the assumption, and, and so I'm saying like, I lead a black think tank. And I'm, I'm saying like, I have been guilty of this in implicit bias is not just something that white folks have uh, here, yeah. right? 
So I just want to say, like, putting it on the table, let's be honest about the data and get whatever training, how we've been programmed, whether it's the news and the overrepresentation of black folks on the news that programs us as, as criminals, whatever it is that's affecting us all, like getting real training about this so that we can kind of come up with some strategies in our own circle of influence, right? And, and building habits around it, being intentional about that. We do that in terms of losing weight. We do that in terms of exercise, whatever it is, being intentional in terms of habit building and, and, and being intentional. And then of course, collaborating and partnering with, with others in terms of that. Uh, so that's kind of circle of influence. I wanna talk a little bit broader uh, uh, quickly here, here at Vienna and say the economy is shifting rather than going back to where we were after all of this is over, how do we use this change to create a new world? We don't have to replicate what has happened in the past. Uh, many of you all know this, this, this history. And, and, and I, I think the policy solution is related to dealing with this wealth issue that I talked about before, and also how do we invest in humanity and human beings? just quickly on this history piece most of our history is like civil rights or when discrimination was there and, and we don't necessarily look at it from an economic standpoint right we don't look at it from the standpoint of five years after the ratification this new innovation the cotton gin comes on the scene and really facilitates the spread of uh, the institution of slavery throughout the deep south and just the huge explosion of uh, slavery and what that results in, in terms of a huge industry where for six decades of the 1800s, cotton was over half of our exports. The most millionaires per capita lived in the Mississippi Valley as a, that was Silicon Valley uh, back then, right? we were able to displace India and China as the leading providers of cotton to the world. Uh, and it's not just a situation where this benefited uh, the South, right? I mean, uh, you think about textiles in New England, shipping lines and financial institutions on the East Coast and places like New York and, and New England uh, here, really, really this whole young country benefited from this institution, enslaved persons from a collateral standpoint, they had greater value than any asset in the United States other than land. And as a result, you know, uh, people were able to borrow uh, against their enslaved persons to get capital, to make investments in order to grow. We quickly became the second largest economic power in the world right behind Great Britain as a result of this uh, institution here, which basically said, how can we, how can we deny, which basically denied the humanity of, of black folks and, and which also um, said, how can we profit off of very cheap labor? Yeah, there's cheap labor in China and India, but this labor is even cheaper. And, you know, Jim Crow after that essentially did the same thing in terms of keeping people uh, restricted in what they could do uh, and keeping them uneducated and keeping this cheap labor force there. And really, obviously, we've got some great leaders like, you know, Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King. And, you know, I, I don't mean to deny black agency, but I, I also do want to acknowledge that uh, you know, the automation of cotton. Cotton was one of the last crops to be automated in, in like the 1940s. And the automation of cotton in the 40s through the late 60s really allowed some economic interests in planters to be more comfortable with the relaxation of Jim Crow because they didn't need this same labor uh, force here in terms of cheap labor force. So how, what, what, what are, the, are these lessons from a policy standpoint? One, 
we got to invest in human beings as opposed to saying that, you know, just building a casino or, you know, low wage manufacturing or food processing plants are going to kind of provide jobs and save folks. You know, we need to invest in human beings in terms of education and health and other opportunities, right? I think another issue is this kind of wealth issue that we've talked about and confronting it squarely. You know, the PPP program in terms of the stimulus, there are a lot of black businesses that didn't, weren't able to take advantage because their lenders were not large commercial banks. They were CDFIs and minority depository institutions that were disfavored under the original CARES Act. And as a result, they didn't get access to capital they didn't get loans, they didn't survive. So how do we, you know, really not just design institutions for kind of a, a large borrowers, et cetera, but design institutions that can ensure things like access to capital, et cetera, for, for smaller businesses, for black businesses, et cetera. So yeah, you know, part of it's skills, and, and don't get me, don't get me wrong. Uh, skills piece is important. I, I'm sorry, I just want to get this out in. We looked at 10 most popular black jobs, right? And those 10 most, and these are like healthcare workers, retail, office clerks, etc. These 10, six of them are on another top 10 list, which is the top 10 jobs that will displace the most Americans by 2030. Right. So we're seeing a decline of these jobs that folks are in. And even those jobs that are not going to be automated, let's say home health care workers, because, you know, the population is growing older, difficult to automate it. You know, those jobs only make about twenty three, twenty four thousand dollars a year. No benefits. National average wage is like fifty two thousand dollars a year. So we don't want a situation, we, we want to give those folks the ladders to new opportunities, a credential, uh, an associate's degree, something that allows folks to move to, you know, a $60,000 a year job or seven, have some in-demand skills and give them a clear pathway uh, forward. And so that economic mobility is very important when we talk about uh, a solution. And again, it's not the only thing. There's still things like implicit bias and hiring and other things that uh, doesn't uh, that, that prevent skills alone from translating into income or wealth. And those things we got to deal with. But, you know, thinking about this from an economic standpoint, I think is really important. Thank you so much, Professor Overton. And I think your points about highlighting the humanity of individuals and really just reimagining society, reimagining our institutions. Um, I hope everyone was taking notes on that. And as we continue the discussion today, um, you know, start thinking about what that means for your committee in particular. So I wanna go to a couple of lightning round questions and I'd ask that you keep your answers really short because we've got a lot that we have to pack into a short amount of time. So uh, Judge Donald, lightning round question for you. We both share the distinct background of being black and female, which is completely different from being black or female. Now, I know personally that you've been a great role model for me and others within the section in terms of your advocacy and your mentorship. Can you just share a little bit about what being a black female and what that intersectional experience has meant to you as a leader? Growing up, my mother always taught me that if something good happens to you, uh, share it, use it to help somebody else. And for me, um, I, I have, just enjoyed the opportunity uh, to be able to acquaint, to draw people, first of all, into to the ABA, but to, to be not only an advocate for, but a supporter of. You know, so many times we don't um, celebrate each other's accomplishments. And for me, uh, being able to be involved in various positions, being able to discern the benefit of, of certain things. Uh, that has been, that has been um, a, a joy and an opportunity. 
you know, for a long time, people thought that if you're a woman and a person of color, you, you, you're doubly benefited. Um, the ABA uh, put out a little a study some years back called the, um, you know, the burdens of both. They found that, that uh, women of color were not doubly benefited. They were doubly burdened. Uh, and um, we have to work harder to find ways to make certain that we're in those spaces, that we're taking advantage of those opportunities uh, that are there. And going forward and doing something it puts a, a an added burden to show that you're going to do it well because how you perform could very well impact whether somebody else gets that opportunity. So I've been mindful of that, but it has been a joy for me to to do, uh, to observe, and to work, and also to help. I really take to heart that reaching back and lifting up and then pushing forward. And while Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, it bends toward justice. I say that it doesn't bend because of any gravitational force. It bends because people of goodwill, uh, people who are committed, push and pull and bend that. And that is our task. And whatever I do in the cause of supporting uh, women and advocating for them, it is so that we can ultimately get to uh, that, uh, that equality. So it's been a joy for me. It's a labor of love, if you will. Uh, but I see so many talented uh, young women in each each generation that stands on the shoulders of the preceding generation. Hopefully, we'll do the, the, the will do that same work, uh, and we'll keep doing that until we achieve that true equality, and we can all just stand on a level plateau as equals and create the society that we all want and and thirst for. Thank you, Judge Donald, and, and thank you again for the work that you continue to do with women within the section and in the legal profession in general. All right, Professor Overton, here is your lightning round question. Um, you are one of the fortunate few people um, probably in this virtual room has ha who has had the benefit of knowing the late great civil rights leader, Congressman John Lewis. Can you talk a little bit about what his legacy has meant for you as, in, in, as a leader and in the work that you do? Hmm. I, you know, I'm not sure if uh, it's just me or... I'm sorry. I think it's <laughs> okay, me. there you go. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, I was just going to say, in terms of the Edmund Pettus Bridge and us crossing it uh, on the 50th anniversary, in addition to me being there, I think another participant on the call who was there was Leslie Overton, right? She's not as tall uh, here, uh, so she wasn't was seen in as many pictures, but she was there. So, you know... She gets me into Dana Point and Doral and West Palm Beach and Whistler through the ABA. And so this was, you know, just, just one uh, little attempt at carrying my water as a spouse. Uh, but my impression on that bridge with President Obama and, and with Congressman Lewis was really very honestly, uh, in addition to, not try, to trying to not trip uh, in front of, you know, all these cameras was um, just this notion of the bridge and moving on and having responsibility in terms of the future. You know, I was, you know, it was honored, it was great, but it was, it was, I realized like I wasn't there because of what I had done, but maybe because of potential in the future and what there is left to be done, right? And so this, I felt a great sense of responsibility as a result of being on that bridge and as a result of the different conversations in my relationship with Congressman uh, Lewis. Uh, Thank you so much. Well, I think if there's one thing that's clear, it's that 45 minutes is not enough time to delve into the complicated issues of race and equity. But if there was just one key takeaway that you would like to have everyone who's participating remember, what would that be? Uh, Judge Donald, I'll start with you. You know, my, my one is going to be a, a, a list. And I, I, have to, I have to honor my mother because as Professor Overton was talking about, you know, the transformation of the South and all of that, you know, People think that's a long time ago, but I actually lived through 
uh, some of that. And my mother was a direct participant in, uh, in, in that work. I mean, she worked long and hard, as did my father. She picked cotton all day for something like 50 cents a pound and chopped all day for two dollars. And, and, and that's what people that's what people did with black folks. So, but she taught me a lot. So I'm going to say this quickly. Uh, growing up in the South, my father taught me courage, self-confidence, generosity, risk-taking, and gave me uh, a zest for life. But my mother taught me the principles that really uh, inform who I am as a judge. First, she taught me to have, pow- have faith in a power greater than myself. She taught me that I am as good as anyone else, but no better than anyone else. She taught me that there's good in everyone. She taught me that jealousy, envy, and hatred are forces that you cannot afford because they will demoralize and ultimately destroy you. She taught me to give a full day's work for a full day's pay. She said anything less than that is stealing. And she said there's value in all honest work. She taught me not to fear or shun people who are different because to those people, I am different. And she taught me that I have a responsibility for my dreams, to nurture those dreams, and to be unafraid to stand alone. And finally, she taught me that I should never, ever shy away from doing tasks that are placed before me if they result in achieving a greater good. And so I would say, I would commend those lessons to our audience today uh, as takeaways. And that will be, that will gird you for the fight that we have ahead of us to move toward full equality. Thank you so much, Judge Donald. Spencer, what's your one quick key takeaway? I think it's recognizing the humanity and the potential of people of color. I think as we talk about how do you concretely do this, you know, when we think about who you work with to be on your teams, who you invest time into in terms of capital, in terms of developing them, you know, ensuring that there are some folks of color who are there saying in your mind, I want to shape the future. And part of that future is folks of color who are talented and who have some of the skills that I have acquired and that other people have given to me. You know, I have a a major mentor who's really the reason that I'm a law professor. His name's Frank Michaelman. He was my property professor at Harvard. Uh, And, you know, uh, a Jewish professor uh, who is probably both one of the smartest people I, uh, the smartest person I have ever met and incredibly humble. uh, uh, And because he invested in me, it's not that I just got an interview. It is that like the quality of work at the joint center is high and I edit everything up. And, and it is tight because of like the time he spent with me and what he invested in me, like the values and commitment to work and the principles that he had, like they are playing out through the work that we do at the Joint Center and because of what he invested in me in terms of his mentoring, even outside of the classroom uh, and you know me sending him drafts and getting feedback and looking at his, all that kind of stuff, right? And I know that Leslie has felt the same way with many section members, Debbie Majoris, uh, others here. So this notion of investing your time, your valuable time in helping to develop other people uh, and, and, and having that kind of confidence in them and in the future that you'd like to see, I think that would be my one takeaway. Thank you so much. Judge Donald, Professor Overton, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to talk with all of us here today. Uh, I have to say how much I appreciate the work that you continue to do within the section, within the legal profession in general, and in the Black community in particular. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. You. Uh, we're going to have a brief, Thanks. oh, my pleasure. We're going to have a brief intermission now while we bring up the panelists for our part two of the discussion today. <laughs>